class of the receiver, uh, we have to uh, fetch the method dictionary from it, and uh, we have to search the dictionary for the selector, and if it's not found, we have to go to the superclass. And if we had to do that, our programs would call. So the first technique to speed that up is called the first level method lookup catch. So if we have a look at the first level method lookup cache, uh, that's basically uh, an associative uh, memory which associates selector class pairs with target methods. And there's some finite space. And um, if I can wear this thing. How about that? Sorry. Um, so um, in uh, Squeak's case, because there are lots of variations on this, um, uh, an object has an identity hash, a small 11-bit uh, field. So that is the selector's hash and the class's hash. And these we can uh, add together and turn into an index of a power of two table by bit masking. And then there's some uh, complications because if you do that, you'll get hash collisions. So there's a, a, a three uh, phase repro where you form alternative combinations of the hash. And if you don't, you know, you don't find uh, it in the table uh, at your first place, you look in, in, in two other places. Well, what do you do? Um, you get the selector and the class and you form a hash function and you look into this table, which is uh, a tuple of, of three entries, and you say, is the selector equal to the selector? Is the class equal to the class? If so, the method's there. If you don't find it, you do that two more times, and if you don't find it, you look up. And when you find what you've looked up, you then enter it into uh, the hash table, looking at some place that... Um, that doesn't already collide. Have you considered using just a linear probing to minimize the uh, reads? Because each read is going to cost a, essentially a cache time read you know, for, for each collision. Um, Does that make sense, or have you tried that? Or? No, I, I, haven't, I haven't thought to try it. And off the top of my head, I, we need to talk about it afterwards. Because you know, the thing is, just don't do it. Rather than trying to make it faster, don't do it at all. So, um, you know, the inline cache avoids doing it. So, the thing is to present that. Okay, so um, this is why small talk interpreters are slow, because uh, uh, even though this is much faster than walking the hierarchy, this is still an extremely slow process. Um, there are things that we haven't seen in this process uh, uh, already, which are, uh, are also um, uh, expensive in that. Um, when we actually do some send, we have to uh, figure out what the message selector is from the bytecode. The bytecode has embedded in it a, a literal index, and we have to go to the method and fetch that object. Uh, then we have to set, assign an argument count variable that we may need later on in, in primitives. We have to fetch the right offset on the stack. So if you know there's a, a, a three argument send, we have to look three down on the send. Uh, and then when we have the object in our hand, we actually have to uh, fetch the class of the receiver. And that's not just an indirection because it might be a tagged integer. So it's a tag test plus a follow. And if, um, if it is tagged, where do we get the class small integer from? We have to go to a table of special objects and at a particular location in that is small integer. So finding a small integer is very, very costly. So all of these operations add up. So the, um, the essential uh, scheme is uh, for, for small talk, all dynamic languages, um, is to map sends to call instructions, because call instructions are well supported by <coughs> contemporary hardware. Um, in small talk, that's difficult, because we have this context model that means that we need to be able to introspect on a stack frame, on, a, on, on an activation. So we have to do some optimization to actually uh, make that these these activations virtual and allow us to actually map that down. 
So once we've done that, uh, how do we go about mapping uh, these sends to uh, call instructions? And that's what I'm going to show you. Um, so I'm going to run my VM simulator. And um, I have a breakpoint in a particular uh, method. So this method happens to be object new, he says without looking. It's always terrifying. Yeah. So this is uh, the object new method. Uh, object class new, sorry. Uh, uh, let me use the message name so I'm not make a complete fool of myself. This guy. <coughs> so we're all familiar with that self basic new initialize, and its bytecode is uh, push self, send basic new, send initialize, return top. This bytecode set is slightly different to the one that Leandro uh, demonstrated yesterday. This is a pure stack machine. There's no. Um, uh, special load receiver. Um, so what we've done is compile this to uh, machine code, which does uh, one of two things. First of all, it removes the interpreter overhead. So the interpreter overhead is uh, fetch the next byte, index a table, and do an indirect jump. And on modern processors, that's uh, less expensive than it was 10 years ago because there's uh, a cache in most processors uh, of um, target addresses, um, which allows it to, to prefetch through these uh, uh, indirect branches. But still, indirect branches uh, are, are slow because without special hardware support, the processor is not allowed to uh, prefetch instructions from the target of the job because it doesn't know where it's going to. And even if it has a, a, a cache of, of, of just very much like a method lookup cache of, of previous locations and previous destinations, um, uh, that's a finite resource. And if your working set is large, you can overflow that. So if your program is very dynamic, you may not get any benefit out of, uh, out of this. So one thing we get from converting to machine code is basically quicker uh, bytecode dispatch because there isn't. Uh, dispatch. But the other thing we have is we have more space. And with more, more space, we can do cleverer things. So here's um, the, uh, the, the method, and here are two sends. So this is what we've mapped uh, sends to in our target executable instruction. Uh, executable instructions. And uh, what's going on here is this is uh, the load of self. And so we fetch uh, self from, the, from somewhere in the stack frame and we push it on the stack. And uh, we also put it in a, a register, in this case, EDX. So EDX has self, in this case. And then uh, the send itself is really these two instructions. And uh, what we do is load a register with uh, a constant, and the constant is the address in memory of the selector basic new. Right, so this is actually the oop uh, of, of basic new. And we follow it by a send of a, of a runtime routine, send zero args. So one thing that's happened here is that we haven't had to set the argument count because it's implicit in this, um, in this call. <coughs> Uh, another thing that hasn't happened is we haven't had to figure out uh, from the bytecode what the offset on the stack of the receiver is. We know in the machine code, uh, because at compile time these things become constants. Things in the interpreter, which are variables, become constants. 
in the, in the machine code. So when I, uh, uh, if I execute this, uh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is the runtime is going to um, do exactly what the interpreter did with the first level method lookup cache. It's going to find, it, it's been given the receiver, it's, it's going to extract the selector from this register. It's going to look in the first level method lookup cache. If it's there, it's going to, to jit that method if it hasn't been jitted. But if it has been jitted, what it's going to do is change these instructions. So what I'm going to do is uh, proceed. And now uh, I'm going to have a look at the same uh, machine code. So let's uh, uh, remember this. <coughs> The second one has uh, has changed. So instead of um, it um, loading the selector into this register, it's loading this bit pattern 28. And instead of calling the runtime routine, it's actually calling uh, initialize at 32. So what's going on here? So this is actually a representation of the class of, um, of an object. Now in Sweep, uh, we have to deal with uh, three different forms. An object may be tagged if it's the integer, in which case the, the key in this variable would be uh, the tag pattern. Uh, up to 32 objects can have a compact class, and there's an array uh, with up to 32 classes in it, and we save space by just storing the index into that table in the header of the object. So up to 32 classes of objects only need one word in memory for their, for their header. Uh, now in this case, uh, unfortunately, we've got one of these compact class indices. It's much more satisfying when you see a, a full class, but we'll see full classes later on. And then the more general case is when you just have the oop of the, of the class. So what happened here? Um, when we first sent the message, we found the class of the receiver at that time, when we first sent the message. And we found some valid method that was valid for that class of receiver and that selector. And we've changed it to call that method. So it's safe to continue executing that if the class doesn't change. Right. So what we need to do is verify when we execute this a lot, because this is software, things happen repetitively, has the class changed or not? So the point about the entry of the method is it's its job to check. Uh, isn't the, when, uh, when you change the class, isn't that uh, flash automatically the cache? Uh, yes, um, and you also have to flash machine code. And, yeah. But, but it's done automatically by the... By the runtime? Run no, it, it, there's a primitive oh. which you have to invoke. So when you assign a new method into a method dictionary, at the bottom of that method you'll see uh, select a flush cache, and then the primitive uh, causes the VM to flush all of its information that shows associated with that selector. And that's a okay, great point. But, but then you, you, why you need to, to check at that time if the class has changed? Yeah, you have to scan through all of, of, of the jitted code looking for that selector. So part of the metadata in the code that you generate allows you to find oh, okay. these send sites so that you can unlink them. It's very important. In fact, one of the things that the JIT does, because it uses a finite amount of memory, is it runs out of memory. 
And when it runs out of memory, it tries to throw away the least recently used methods, just like a paging algorithm. And in that case, you need to go through all of the sends to the methods that you're that you're throwing away and set them back to this unlinked state. Right? So what what does the entry code have to do? It grabs the, the current receiver. What's the receiver the next time we execute the method? Some subsequent time. And so we copy it into a scratch register and we test. In this case, I mean, every language is going to be, implementation is going to be slightly different. Some might have two tag bits, some might have four, whatever. It's quick as one. Test, is it the small integer? If it's the small integer, that tag pattern is the key. Okay? So, if you're talking about sending a message to a small integer, if the inline cache has one in it, then that's valid for small integer and not for anything else. So now we jump, you know, we jump down to, uh, to U at 37 down here. Okay. So one thing we've done, we do the tag test. And you notice we had to do a tag test in the interpreter when we did the fetch class. Right. In the fetch class, there was, is it tagged? It's the small integer object. But here we're avoiding going to the table of objects to fetch small integer because the tag that we use is the tag pattern. The next thing we have to do is we have to... Um, fetch the first word of the object, shift it and mask it with the compact class index field. So this has extracted the 5-bit field which can code for those uh, 32 special classes. And if that's non-zero, then that's the tag. So again, we avoid indirecting through the special objects array to find the array of classes, which we then have to indirect to find the actual class. <coughs> and if none of those is true, then we have to fetch a word which unfortunately doesn't just have the class in, it also has two tag bits. So we have to and it. Now in visual works, this is and with three, because you've got immediate characters and small integers. If it's non-zero, jump. Otherwise, fetch the class word. So it's tiny. So this space optimization costs us on every procedure call. And I will kill it dead as soon as I can. But never mind. It's still way faster than what the interpreter did. Basically, what is the cost here? On a modern uh, processor, which is doing extensive uh, uh, prefetch, which has the speed of modern processors, we only store at the read of the class. <coughs> so essentially, most of these instructions are for free, whereas the interpreter was littered with reads. The second read is a negative offset, but it cache it anyway. I think if you change the order, it might be something. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, um, uh, no, I mean this. This is interesting, and, and you know, you, you know, you can you can do good, uh, good anal analysis and good engineering looking at those those, those trade-offs. And I haven't really uh, emphasized this because this is what, like the first stage. Let, let's get it working. And you want to get rid of it. Yeah, <laughs> and I want to get rid of it. So, so finally, all this comes down. Once we've extracted either the tag or the compact class or the actual class object, is we compare the value we've just computed against the value that was loaded as a constant load at the send site. And if those two match, we can continue. If they don't match, we jump back here and we call an abort routine. And then the runtime is going to look up the method anew. Now, when I came to um, ParkPlace and worked on the VisualWorks VM, uh, one of the things that happened in this inline checking was that the check did not check for small integers here. It checked for small integers in the abort routine. The code looked like, and with with three, if it's non-zero, call the abort. Fetch the class if it matches. And in the abort routine, the abort routine would do the tag test. Uh, because nobody had the intuition that you could use the tag pattern as a valid thing. So when I, I implemented that, that was my first month's work. Uh, uh, one benchmark, Takeuchi, went an order of magnitude faster. An order of magnitude faster. And I went out and bought a new car. <laughs> <laughs> so 
but that was great. Um, so then the next thing is, what do you do when you get a miss? Well, if you look at the statistics, the vast majority of send sites, 90% of send sites do not miss. So the first engineering decision in that, in that VM was, we will repatch the send site. Okay, so if you do get a miss in the 10% of sends where the send site is polymorphic, you look up, you find a new jitting method, you go back to the send site, you change the class to point to the current class, and you may have to change the method to point to a new method because the method may not have changed, and then you continue execution. So if you look at a, an interpreter in, a, in a, a profiler, you'll see a huge peak in all of that online cache, in that first level method lookup cache logic, it's where the bulk of the time is going. If you look in a, a VM that only has monomorphic inline caches, so called monomorphic because it only has room for one class, you'll see a huge peak rebinding methods. So, what's the reason for that? The reason for that is that processes are so fast at executing straight line code and so slow at doing all of this instruction space modification. They don't like instruction modification. They have to flush their caches, etc. That's an expensive operation. So what do we do? Um, the self team uh, in 91 said, if we get a miss, given that misses were becoming increasingly expensive, we should not rebind. We should create a jump table that can deal with more than one case. And so that's now a polymorphic inline cache. <coughs> so let me proceed. And let me proceed twice. And now let's have a look at that same uh, same site. So we're talking about uh, this guy. Uh, method in object will be used. 
It may not necessarily. Somebody implements an initialized method in a subclass. We'll go there. So we don't always go to the same place. It just happens in this initial example, all of these classes inherit the default object implementation. And that's something that's very common. And one thing that uh, you can observe, uh, maybe a negative pattern is the right way to implement this, is that you know if you had a, uh, a whole program analysis, you would um, have a jump table which looked at the exceptions. And then your base case would be to jump to the object one. But we don't do whole program analysis, so we can't take that approach. We can only deal with what we've encountered so far. Okay, so this thing is uh, an extensible jump table. And if we fall off the bottom of, of the jump table, we call another routine <laughs> that says we've fallen off the end. And if there's room with the current class, which we know is new, which is not one of these existing ones, we can extend that machine code until we run out of space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please, feel, feel, feel free. Um, sorry for interrupting. Um, you, say, you say that for each call site, <coughs> you have uh, six more or less possible uh, classes to that selector, uh, to, to that call site. Uh, so no, I to, that, to that pit, do you think what happened to the original call site? The original call site was a call to the runtime, yes. and then it became a call to a method. Yes. And then we executed that with a class that didn't match. Yes. So then we cut that link, yes. and we put in a jump table in the middle, which is this thing, and that thing jumps to the original method. So the call site calls our jump table okay. and says, is it this class? If so, go to the original one. If it's this, go somewhere else. If it's that, go somewhere else. So there's another thing that we've been inserted between the call site and the target. Wait, I was thinking in, uh, so we have a collection with instances of a lot of different classes. Like I send, I do a do, and I say, I send a message, I, I guess that that table will be that's right. So what will, what, will, what will happen is that is that you know the first time you execute it you get monomorphic. The second time you execute it you get two, and then three, and then four, and then five, and six. And then oh my God, what are we doing? You know this guy's crazy. He's using polymorphism. This shouldn't be allowed. What do we do? You know, so we're going to see what we're going to do now. Okay. So what are we going to do? So uh, we continue. And let's see what we've got now. So now the case has grown to four, etc. I have to keep on proceeding quickly. This is getting dull. Let's see, let's see. And now we got somewhere else. So now let's have a look at our uh, pick. The tyranny of, of demos is that you're a, a victim of the presenter's inability to use the programming system or invent tools that make this easy. Sorry. So now we've got six cases and we're full up. And so we had whatever the class was at the, at the uh, send site dictionary, shape, queue, delay, order collection, set. Um, so, okay, you implement your VM. And uh, you don't deal with the falling off the end case except by going back to what the interpreter did. So that's the default engineering choice. You're going to look in the first level method lookup cache, and you're going to try and jump to that method. Now what you see is your spike has moved from updating the call site to that process. And now it's even bigger because your VM is so much faster at doing everything else that this has become even more costly than it was in the context of the interpreter. So um, you really do need to do something about this. So what uh, uh, the next stage uh, is, 
is let's implement an implementation, sorry, let's, let's construct an implementation of the first level method lookup cache and machine code. But let's not do a general one, let's make it specific to this call site, or at least to this selector. Because if we do it for this selector, then the selector is a constant in the machine code. It's not a variable, it's not taking the register. Uh, its hash is a constant in the machine code. So half of the construction of the, of the probe has been taken away. Okay, we still have to do some reads and some fetches, but so um, that's what this does. we've got a, a fifth type, and I won't drag you through all of this, but this is an open pick now because it deals with any number of classes. It's an open set. Uh, and it starts off with a similar prologue, but basically it is a machine code implementation of that first, first level method lookup cache algorithm that you saw with the three locations. So um, what's going on in COG and in, in the VisualWorks VM is this evolution of the, the send site. So you start off with a send that isn't taken, and some 70% uh, of those <coughs> in uh, a standard suite of benchmarks or in running the system uh, <coughs> typically will, will <coughs> convert into the monomorphic inline cache. And of those, only uh, about 100%, uh, about 9% get converted into polymorphic dispatches of degree six. So it's a very steep exponential decline, a lot of twos, say half as many threes, and then it really does tail off. Um, but still, this 1% this, 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 this of sends that are not uh, being uh, catered for by, by monomorphic and polymorphic uh, closed picks uh, is, is, is expensive enough that uh, you, you see the cost. And this remaining 1% uh, is still um, uh, a source of, uh, of some cost. Now there are some interesting things that you can do from here. One of the things that you can notice is that um, extending picks is expensive. So what's the likelihood if I extend a pick of it evolving into an open pick? Well it turns out it depends on the selector quite often. So certain selectors, such as initialize, are very likely to be associated with uh, megamorphic call sites. So it can be profitable to maintain the set of open picks that you've generated so far in a list. And when you do the monomorphic miss, before you create the closed jump table and go through the effort of extending that, you check, does this selector already exist in the set of ones that I've created? And you, and you link to that. And that can uh, save you uh, some time. And in about, uh, I think, 70, 80% of cases, that's, that's the right choice. And so open picks are slightly slower than, 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 than uh, closed picks, but that, that's a win. There's a more interesting thing that you can notice, and that is... Uh, and I call this the, the, the tragedy of pick proportions. And that is that um, your VM has cleverly optimized all of the easy to optimize message sets. Because all of these megamorphic methods, they're at the root of the hierarchy, and they take the longest effort to look up as you walk as you by minutes. Yeah, that's great. But, um, because if you think of... of uh, uh, you know, initialize there and, 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 and Boolean and, 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 and true and false. If we were to send initialize, what do we do? We, we find false uh, in its method dictionary and look in it, it's not there. And then we go up to Boolean and we look in its method dictionary and it's not there. And then we go up to, to behavior, to object effectively, and, 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 we, and we find it. Uh, and then 
that, that would be an instance of true of the sense item. And then if we send it to an instance of false, uh, we fetch false's dictionary. And then we repeat the intermediate one in Boolean. And then finally we, we find it. So uh, a cooler thing that you can do is um, when you find the entry, you don't just put it in the first level method lookup cache under the bottom class. You know, this is an instance of true and for it initialize goes to here. You also do it for Boolean. So you say, if you have an instance of Boolean, that goes to the method that you found up here. And if you have an instance of object, that goes. So when you then do the lookup for, for true, you do the first level method lookup cache pro at each level in the class. So when you go to the superclass, you say, okay, let's look at the first level method lookup cache. And so now you've copied this thing down into all of the places on the tree for which it's valid. And that can have a, a, a huge uh, performance benefit. Uh, of, of course, the benefit depends on how expensive it is to search method dictionaries. So if you make method dictionary search fast, you, you know, you're your advantage can evaporate, but at one stage I saw like a 30% increase from, from, from doing that. It's quite extraordinary, but I suspect my measurements now. Um, so that's another thing that you can you can do, which is cool. But the real thing that you do. Where are the variations? So. So yeah, because of because of the hash, because of reading, because of, of, of hitting some uh, unexpected object or new class, you know, having to fault in objects into the memory hierarchy, because of, of um, uh, the, the, the cost of, of, of search, uh, you know, all of those all of those reads, um, uh, fetching object hashes and, 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 and the like, it's just you know expensive. But the real thing that you can do with this is the observation that the original. Uh, self team made in 91 when they implemented PIX is that okay, megamorphic sends are difficult to deal with, but what's happening with the, uh, the polymorphic sends is that the runtime is collecting runtime type information as we continue. So, what this program does is by optimizing it itself, record for each taken send site what are the sets of classes of receiver type and their target methods. And that's valid for 99% of executed sends. It's only 1% of our sends that, that, that fall outside of this pattern, which is great. So what happens in those VMs is we find some way of stopping execution when the program is doing something busy, uh, which could be a counter when you invoke a method, or it could be a counter on conditional branches. And then uh, effectively you get a, a, a stop, the system stops running. It can analyze the call stack, examine uh, some number of methods, some number of methods deep, look at the uh, type information uh, in this program, and uh, construct some super method which inlines and eliminates all of these calls. That code is only valid if the classes don't change. So around each basic block, we have to establish checking code. We have to write checking code that says, you can only enter this basic block if this variable is of these classes and that variable is of those classes. And if you get a violation, you can uh, de-optimize, go back to the original code. Uh, but, if, uh, but if not, um, this super method is now much bigger. It completely eliminates uh, this dispatch. There's no checking. Uh, we can flatten common code, uh, eliminate loss of the, of the boilerplate, and finally make this code uh, 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 large enough that we can profit from aggressive optimizations of the kind that you see in a C compiler. So that's the architecture that you see in current Java VMs that you saw in uh, the, the StrongTalk uh, VM, uh, which will be a part of, of Gillard's talk uh, tomorrow. Um, and remains to be work that Marcus and I are anxious to do uh, in, uh, in call. Thank you. Questions? Okay. Just a comment.
uh, I did measure with the hash method dictionaries as opposed to sort of collection method, method dictionaries. You get like in the, in the really bad cases where every send is a lookup, you get like 70% faster execution. Yeah, so it's so it's, it's, yeah, yeah. A huge difference. Um, I've been interested in, in um, getting those measurements off you because I, I would love to write a paper on this because I don't think this has ever been written up. The, 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 the copying stuff down so we could write that paper together. So that, that would be nice. Uh, the last uh, optimization you described, uh, I don't know how the case in Stronger, but uh, so is that type feedback information that the virtual machine is collecting available to the smart programmer? Because this is for annotations in the source code to understand the model. Well, I think that this applies very much to, to, to Rich's architecture, is that uh, we want to implement this useful tool dynamically in the image. And um, with contexts, you have an abstraction. With context and white code, you have an abstraction away from a specific instruction set. And so you could, uh, uh, and I have built lower levels of this, uh, access that type information as small for object. So ask the context for an array that gives you bytecode PC and then an array of the class type method pairs or a conditional branch and the taken and untaken frequencies and use that to, to write the uh, optimizing for the small problem. But the uh, RIP machine can go way further than that. Okay, thank you.